Yeah, let's do it. I'm interested to hear mm. some from let's all of you guys, rats. actually. I'm really intrigued. Yeah, so welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Shop Talk. What edition is this, Sam? Is this like eight or ten or you keep count? I think ten. I think ten. Let's say ten. Ten. All right. Ten. Not bad. And so we're back on our monthly schedule, as you are aware. And thank you for those who came out. We've suspected that numbers are going to creep down. And so that's why we went to a monthly format. And uh, we're going to have to decide if we keep going with that monthly format or not, or just change our times, that sort of thing, to see if we can't get information out. I still think it's a useful exercise in Canada that the strength conditioning profession gets a chance to interact a little bit. The good news, because the numbers are down, well, I guess it could be bad news, could mean that they're sick of us and feel like there's no value in our time. But I like to argue that it's probably more because people are actually back at work a little bit. So yeah. let's hope that that's the truth and um, it's not just our random rantings. Anyway, today we're going to go through our usual updates in the industry and then we will uh, go into our keynote. We have a couple of esteemed fellows joining us as well as good old fashioned Sam who's always here anyway. And uh, but before we get into that, a little bit of updates from the Canadian Strength and Conditioning Association. I'll re represent them. There is an annual general meeting on November the 29th, which I believe is a Sunday at 3 p.m. Pacific. So that'd be 6 p.m. Eastern time. It'll be approximately three hours long. And at this annual general meeting, all members, anybody interested in being involved, I'm assuming are going to be invited. Uh, but it'll be more for the board and the advisory panel that currently exists, where they'll be reviewing bylaws, standards and practices, um, uh, marketing and social media, and then the education and credentialing. Uh, the idea behind this, uh, I haven't quite figured out, are we going to vote? I'm not sure. We might actually do votes on who's where and does what jobs. Uh, the bylaws are pretty much done. You know, they're bylaws, pretty boring, not much to it. But the standards of practice, I think we have to think about a little bit and credentialing we have to think a little bit about. And then for the next year, where are we going? What's the plans for the next year? What's our gradual growth model? How do we reach out? Do we start bringing in true memberships? What's the value for membership? That sort of thing. So that's the big news coming out. There's a newsletter also, the usual quarterly newsletters coming out in October, theme being professional sports. Um, there's been a lot of articles published. We don't always wait for the newsletter to publish articles. There's stuff uh, like we had one of our student, first student research articles that came out of uh, Memorial University. Erica Noel, and uh, on empathy and training. Shout out to the BAM lab there. And uh, so we're trying to get uh, outreach to other universities. I know it's a difficult time right now. A lot of people aren't even able to collect human data. So, but maybe people are stuck in the lurch and have half data sets that they still wanna talk about. And so the CSCA is one avenue where we can get those kinds of articles out. So that's the CSCA. NSCA, I didn't hear anything from Jordan. Sam, did you hear anything? Any NSCA updates? No updates. Jordan's uh, stuck on what he calls in the range. I guess they're, uh, he works for uh, Special Forces, so he's not able to things. make it today, but he's, uh, he's out there. But nothing so far. Things are pretty status quo in terms of still trying to figure out um, some of the new certs that are going on. And it's actually reaching international, quite a few people have been inquiring with myself in terms of uh, people that are overseas. Is this worth getting? Should I be getting this? So it looks to be making quite a, quite a spark yeah. internationally here. So NSCA's a uh, well-recognized name and you know, you can debate its value, but because it's a well-recognized name and you add that to it, it's, it could be a value add for a small fee. The NSCA, the, the big thing is for most of us, the CSCS credential um, renewal is December of this year. So we've been putting it off, putting it off, putting off. Uh, probably you should start peeking at it and jogging your memory as to all the conferences you've gone to in the last three years and all the little workshops and other activities you've done. Update your CPR and first aid if you can. I'm not even sure where you can right now. So you can get those credits as well. Okay, on to you, sport. What's going on, Sam? So, in terms of fall sports, we all know that the fall sports have been canceled competition-wise. We have until October 8th for there to be a decision, or you sport does, uh, to make a decision about winter sports. Uh, pretty looming, I would say, across most regions is definitely a concern that it'll most likely be decanceled. 
mainly based on the fact from finances more than anything. It's a lot more expensive to run a season than not run a season. So uh, I think there's a lot of concern over that. And then if that happens, everything down from sport coaches to assistant S&C coaches to head S&C coaches, right? Like we're not really sure how things are going to pan out there. And that, that includes York as well, where I'm, I'm located. But um, there's lots of schools moving forward with training, which is, I think, pretty good in terms of insight where we might actually be able to maintain our positions over other sport coaches potentially based on the fact that it's really the only thing that they can be doing. Some programs are allowing sport practice, some aren't. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the AUS. So Elliot Richardson kind of is our little hub out there, provide us with some updates. Acadia's uh, varsity training started and they'll be ramping up when school starts and their school actually uh, paused for an extra week. They don't start till the 21st. Stand FX, they started varsity training as well indoors. They're going to slowly ramp up. MSU, no classes, but looking to start varsity training on the 21st indoors. UNB indoors, UPEI. Uh, they use S&C coaches on a contractor basis. So some teams are, some teams aren't, but it's external and private settings. Uh, and then Dell, there hasn't really been much word in terms of what they're doing. Um, it, one of the things that they did a long time ago was they, deter they decided that they're actually not going to have people on on campus period until um, January. So that includes all their staff. So they're in a bit of a situation if even we were in competitive setting. So that'll be really interesting. Um, can West, Sam, maybe you can speak a little bit more. What I got from Joe is that, you know, most places are up and running, but UBC is currently onboarding 600 students at a time. Um, from the sounds of it, pretty staggered, but anything out on your end, Sam, that you, uh, that you kind of have your ear to the ground to? Yeah, so uh, BC also, also recently uh, approved cohort competition um, at all levels. So now the Canada West schools are looking at cohort exhibition play potentially for the fall to substitute the season. I know Alberta has already done, has already been in a cohort system for a while now. Um, so those are the conversations that are happening for the fall. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Cool. Joe didn't give me that update. I'm going to go to you next time. <laughs> I, I've got my ear to the ground. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So there has been some discussion here in the, in the OUA uh, in doing some sort of cohort exhibition, except the OUA has decided that it's on um, the athletic directors of each school to determine whether they want to do that based on finances. So you're going to get into a little bit of a tricky situation in terms of what schools probably have money. Um, I don't know much about that for the other programs, but the RSEQ is always really fun to talk about because they are the Wild West and they have been up and running pretty much status quo for quite some time. Um, the university presidents voted two days ago uh, in terms of uh, playing or not, and that motion will come out in on Monday, um, but I didn't get that sneak peek yet, unfortunately. Um, they think the universities, the general idea or the thought is that they, they probably won't play, but CJF will go for sure. 50% um, of the schools have started practicing, uh, but they, if they are practicing, it's full contact. So it's a lot different than what's kind of going on here. Um, in terms of the OUA, you've probably seen a lot of Instagram posts for those that are Ontario in tier, but Brock is up and running as of last week. Uh, we're going to start um, next week as well in indoors. That's the plan. We've been outdoors for quite some time now. Um, I really actually enjoy the outdoors a little bit better uh, than the indoors. That is mainly because I'm in a basement. Um, Guelph, not a whole lot going on. I know Trev does some work with some of the people at Guelph and has his ear to, gr ear to the ground there. Uh, one of the big things that did happen is there was a massive explosion on campus. Uh, their, Zambon their Zamboni blew up uh, in their arena. So they have canceled all hockey uh, for the for, uh, foreseeable future, which is what brought in a lot of uh, their revenue. Um, and it's one of the only pads actually uh, in that Guelph, Halton Hills, Wellington area. So uh, that's, that's unfortunate. Max looking to open their new fancy facility in October. They got a brand new facility, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it's a little bit conflicting. I know Max Central shut down all athletics face to face, uh, but they're really trying to maneuver that with their athletic director. So, you know, Ben's not really sure what's going to go on there. Um, I 
think that's uh, I think that's about it. One of the things that I'm curious about is, you know, many schools have started practicing already. Uh, we really haven't allowed our uh, coaches to start sport practice, but um, any anyone have their ear to the ground in terms of what other programs are doing for sport practice? Some are already doing five on five in Ontario. I mean, that's what I'm most interested in. But you know, Dave, do you have any idea what are your sport coaches doing over there? Um, yeah, so our court sports have started practicing a little bit um, based on the PSO NSO guidelines, um, but they're basically starting wherever the PSO NSO phase one was, and then sort of meshing it with um, our capabilities. So all of our sport coaches had to go through and submit full sort of return to sport plans, um, and then on well protocols and um, all of those kind of factors. Right now we're at somewhere between, well, basketball is going kind of two people per net, one ball um, between two people type thing, um, say, which is in line with Basketball Canada. Volleyball is doing 10 people on court, but it's just uh, individual skills, um, no, no five on five or six on six um, court stuff. Um, in terms of hockey, just got the okay to do some practicing um, in line with provincial guidelines. But that's about it. We've only had a handful of practices. And then before any of our students can kind of go in, they get screened, they get their temperature taken. Um, they have to have, they've had to have submitted a, a negative COVID test um, and a, a few other procedures just so that we can contact trace them and everything. And they're, they're masks on into the gym and then they're masks on on the way out. And we're trying to do the best we can that way. Yeah, interested to see. I mean, Ryerson is already up and running. Obviously, our our athletes are constantly asking, like, how come Ryerson and Max they get to they get to practice, right? So it's pretty hard, really hard for those athletes based on the individual um, yeah. programs making their own decisions. It's it's, uh, it's really interesting, and I bet you quite hard for them too. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I got there, Trev. Nice. So Mac is running sport. I thought that they were talking about shutting down all student recreation and strength conditioning across the board. Did you get, isn't that what was going on, but they still are practicing is what you're saying. Yeah. So there's a conflict. I was talking to Ben uh, the other day, there was a, a conflict. Um, I mean, Dave's at Brock, right? Not at, um, not at Mac, but um, they were hoping to start up in October 1st and then they, they weren't told by um, their athletic director or anyone, their athletic director didn't know either. And they just shut down. They, there was a notice that went out on their listserv that said, you know, Max Central has made the decision that no athletics and rec programs will be face to face for the fall. And they didn't know that that wasn't information to them. So now they're trying to figure out what does that mean? Does that mean them? They had plans to open October 1st, have given approval, but it's a bit of a mess. I would say so. Communication, rough yeah. these days. Yeah, it's great, yeah. Uh, private facilities, not a lot to report. My ear to the ground is generally across the board. Most facilities are trickling back. Uh, a lot of them are at 30% loss right now, which, it's kind of what you'd predict. And uh, I seem to see that number keeps coming up again and again. I know at our facility and others, that seems to be where it is. But some are at least covering costs. Some are making small profits. Profits. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the large box. I'm just talking about some of the small box S&C folk that I know. Uh, what seems to be the big thing is obviously a small group um, is the way to go right now where you can book a space and reserve that space for a, an individual a small group of people who can do the whole so social distancing and tracking thing and that seems to be where people are putting their money instead of going to the big boxes and dumping 80 bucks an hour on a personal trainer the, some of those groups like f45 which is that kind of a crossover between crossfit and meets orange theory kind of training seems like they're doing all right. They seem to be catching a lot of the Canadian market right now. Their numbers are still lower, but they, uh, their marketing is fierce and uh, they seem to be really getting a lot of people in the door. And it's not a cheap price point, it's about 200 a month, give or take. And uh, people are paying that. And again, instead of hiring personal trainers and that kind of thing. So I don't have a lot more information on that on the private side. 
uh, pro sports side. Anybody watch the football last night? First game? Of course. Poor Andy Reid and his fogged up. <laughs> I was just howling. I was going, guy's got glasses to begin with, and then he's got a fogged up visor on. I was going, there's got to be, got to be a better system there. Someone give him a cloth or something. Come on. Anyway, so it's good to see it's back, but we'll see if they can't keep things going without getting a bunch of people sick. I'm surprised right. they didn't hire someone to actually wipe it for them. Yeah, who's who's the uh, who's the <laughs> lackey who has to carry around the 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 sham wow and <laughs> wipe that down? What the heck? That sounds like a strength coach job in the NFL. Yeah, yeah. Get Plenty back, up. get back, coach, Plenty and up. here's a here's a towelette. Uh, anyway, that's why I get paid the big bucks. Okay, folks, let's get on to the keynote. So debated batted around some ideas on this talk and um the reason we we stuck with the talk we did today is because sam had an interesting project and one of my students was actually involved in doing some of the background research for it and so the topic grossly stated today is athlete non-responders uh, so athletes that don't respond to training what do we mean by that well it could mean a lot of different things it could mean um they aren't getting stronger, they aren't getting faster, they aren't excelling on the field, uh, maybe they aren't gaining weight when they're supposed to, maybe they're not losing weight when they're supposed to. So there's a lot of different ways you could define non-response training. The bottom line is as strength conditioning coaches, the goal is to move our athletes toward whatever goals we've set for them. And if they're not moving towards those goals, then we have to very critically evaluate why that is. Uh, in some cases it could be the programming, but uh, let's assume that we're all great at our jobs and uh, the programming is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But for this individual, it could be the programming for this individual, but it could be a myriad of other factors that could be contributing to it. So today we have some guests, very special guests. I'm not gonna get them to give too much background for sake of time because they're all gonna get a voice, but from Memorial University, we have Dr. David Bam. Wave to everybody, hi. From Canadian Sports Institute, Ontario, we have Dr. Andrew Cochran. Wave, hi, yeah. And then good old Sam Isles from York University will be following up at the back end. So the approximate agenda, I'm gonna give a little rant for a couple slides as always. Then I'm gonna pass it off to the science guys. So Dr. Bam and then uh, Andrew Cochran, Dr. Cochran. And we're gonna talk about is there uh, any good science for this and what are the markers that we're looking at and measuring. And then Andrew's going to give a little bit of anecdote on some of the troubles he ran into trying to get an athlete to respond. He gave a presentation on this last year at a conference and it was really interesting. And then we're going to go into Sam's little project that she did trying to figure out why is it that some of her athletes aren't responding? What are the factors? Hopefully at the end, we're going to be able to wrap it up with some ideas of what are the best ways to monitor athletes for responsiveness and then come up with some strategies and interventions that some people use, hopefully low cost, easy to do, where we can bring people in and um, figure out what is it that we can do to help these individuals. Is it diet? Is it sleep? Is it counseling? Is it variety? Of, there's probably 400 different things we could approach. So I'm just gonna share my screen here for a minute, go a little sciencey on you. Shout out to Ian who jo just joined us. Ian Warner. Up, Ian? Ian Warner is in the house. Awesome. Hopefully he'll have some anecdotes for us as well. Okay, folks, you should have a nice black and white slide in front of you. We've known for quite a long time, and if anybody's been in this business, not everybody adapts the same way. Everybody has a slightly different way that they improve in response to training and the work of the good old Claude Bouchard, good old Canadian fella, for years and years, he's been looking at this and looking at non-responsiveness. And so this is early, early work where this was actually a fairly decent exercise intervention. And it was, for lack of a better word, a normal population of, it was 18 to 60 year olds, uh, average people, non-active. And they put them on a progressive endurance training protocol. And this was a multi-province, multi-state. So two of these graphs represent the provinces, two represent the states, don't worry about that. And um, they monitored just changes in a variety of factors, one being the good old VO2 max, which is a measure of aerobic fitness. And we all know if we do aerobic exercise, we stress the body and the body doesn't like stress and it should adapt so that it can better deal with that stressor in the future. Therefore, it becomes better at carrying oxygen, using oxygen in the muscle, and therefore VO2 max should go up. 
So what you have here are four different graphs, two representing two Canadian provinces, two representing two American states. And on the y-axis, we have the change in VO2 max. And on the x-axis, you have the individual number. So there's, uh, what was it? 480 or so subjects in this study. And what you see is from on the left side, or on the right side here, these are the people who responded the most, and it's rank ordered to the people who responded the least. And you can see that some people really respond well and other people do not respond well at all. And then there's even a cohort that may actually get worse. So get that, you go out and you exercise for 14 weeks. These guys were going four days a week and you get in worse shape. What the heck, how does that happen? Well, it does. And so this has led to a variety of follow-up research and um, Here's a little bit more recent, same group, and they're actually looking at exercise interventions. And this was across multi-centers, multi-trials. So it was almost like a bit of a meta-analysis in some ways, how they combined different trials from all over the Canada and the US. And they looked at factors predicting health. And again, the exercise interventions varied slightly, but it was basically an endurance protocol. And here we can see fasting insulin, plasma triglycerides, HDL levels, systolic blood pressure. All these are your traditional markers of health. And these uh, overall 1600 subjects uh, over, underwent these interventions for, they kind of varied in time. But again, what you'll see on the far right um, here is the, uh, the, the people who respond positively. On the far left here are the people who responded positively. Here's the people who responded positively. So you want triglycerides and systolic blood pressure to go down. But the, the note is these red ones. So not only did they get worse, so below the line would be worse in this case, above the line would be worse in this case. Not only did they get worse, but these would be considered truly adverse health effects. So exercise actually made these people worse. So that's a pretty significant non-response. So why is this happening? Coming into more of an athlete model, this is more your recreational college aged athletes who are stimulated either with an endurance protocol, which is your standard 40 minute, um, this was a very short term study, 40 minutes, 75% VO2 type thing. And they uh, also had a sprint interval training. Uh, what was it? Eight bouts, six to eight bouts of 30 second sprints, something like that. My memory's flagging a little bit. But what we have here is uh, the correlations in between change of VO2 amongst sprint intervals on the Y and endurance on the X. And then down here we have change in lactate thresholds, sprint interval on the Y and endurance on the X. And what you'd see is if everybody responded perfectly well to these kinds of stimulus, you'd see a nice straight line. Some people may be responding a little bit more, some people respond a bit less, but you'll see that there's absolutely no relationship between those people who are responders to interval training versus endurance training. And then this gray here, here actually re represents almost a negative response. So zero and zero, you can see that there is no improvements. Now again, three week study, no big deal, but you can see there's a fairly good grouping of non-responders. And then there's some people who responded really well to the interval training and people who responded very well to the endurance training. So what is it that is creating these different responders versus non-responders and why is there so much individual variability in it? Looking at this data even further, you can see that each of these subjects, so 21 subjects overall is represented here. This is the endurance training group. Here's your sprint interval group. Here's individual one, two, three, four to 21. Same thing down here. So it was a crossover design. Both people, both the individual did both different treatments. So there was a washout period between each treatment. And you see here, these white squares mean that they responded. So there's a certain percentile change that they are calling responding. Gray means they didn't respond. Black means they actually got worse. Dots mean that they weren't able to analyze it. So you can see here, subject one responded well uh, to the endurance for VO2 and lactate threshold, but they didn't respond that well uh, to the sprint inter intervals. So what, the reason why you do these kinds of things is just so you can get a visual of what are the patterns that you see that you can't always see with just looking at means or looking at a correlation. And looking at this and the authors agree, um, there was no pattern that they could figure out as to who responded and who didn't. It looked overall like there would tend to be a little bit more response to the VO2 stuff. But if you look over non-responder percentages here on the far, uh, far right, 
it wasn't that much different. So here we have a situation where, again, what are the factors that are leading to this? Well, people are trying to tease it out. Of course, we all go to genetics. A student came to me about three years ago saying, I want to do my fourth year research project looking at this new genetic analysis. There's a genetic analysis. You send away your, uh, your spit. They'll send you back the kind of athlete you are and how well you respond to interval versus resistance training versus endurance training. And then it'll help you better streamline your training so that you aren't beating your head against the wall and not responding to certain types of exercise. And this study is a recent one that came out that, well, not so recent, but in the last five years that was related to what they were looking at. And um, basically they're trying to assess the genes that predicted people who responded to one type of exercise versus another. And the bottom quote, what you'll see is pretty much sums it up even though they try to tightly control the study, which is really hard in individuals, humans are humans after all, preliminary uh, outcomes show that there's considerable individual variability, both in performance and muscle adaptation to a given training stimulus. Overall, more research is needed. So we don't know if there is a genetic marker and Goodness, if you look at some of the research that's been going on for 20, 30 years, trying to identify genetic markers Endurance training, they've found a few for sure, but in strength, power, sprinting, um, I don't think there is much out there. So that's my rants for now. And so now I wanna to go to Dr. David Bam over at Memorial University to give us his two cents on where is the research on this non-responsive to, to training? Am I missing something? Am I misinterpreting things? And why are people not even doing these studies? I have some of my ideas, but uh, maybe he can share with us what he understands of the topic. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. So Dr. Ben. All right, All right. thanks Trevor. Um, just to start off with, uh, to say this is not an area that I do a lot of research in or any research. So I'm not, uh, I would not consider myself an expert, but uh, this morning I was um, writing down some notes and looking at a few studies and trying to get prepared. So I got a few, um, hopefully interesting uh, insights. So um, talking about why the science doesn't work. Well, as you probably know, uh, when you're reading research, uh, we try to control, as I said in one of your slides there, uh, this was tightly controlled or not tightly controlled, but being tightly controlled is not always the, uh, the best situation when it comes to applying it to the, to the field. So we do often a reductionist viewpoint so let's get rid of all the variables that we can and let's look at this one variable because if we have 10 variables and something changes, well, which one of those variables did it? Well, we don't know, there's 10 of them. So let's get it down to one variable. But when it comes to responders and non-responders, as you've mentioned, there's so many different variables. So if you're reading, and another point I wanna make before I go on to some of these possible variables is you're reading the research and of course, we're always into inferential statistics. So your P has to be 0.05. Now the studies that you showed actually looked at correlations, which would be better because you can have um, data points that weren't significant, but they'll still contribute to your correlation and help tell us whether there's a relationship between um, the, uh, the training and the measure or whatever. But when it comes to, you know, if you have a training program and uh, the uh, example I like to give is that you could have this, uh, for example, a, a diet program you've got a bunch of obese individuals, they're all 500 pounds, and you put them on a diet for a year, a really hard diet for a year. And these 1,000 individuals, they all lose about a pound. Well, your p-value is probably gonna be p is less than 0 0.0001, because every single one of those 1,000 people lost a single pound, or two pounds, or whatever. So it's a great p-value, but who the hell wants to go on a diet for a year and lose one pound and weigh 500 pounds? But if you had a program that it worked for 70% of your people uh, and, and you want to report that in your study, well, you probably wouldn't achieve a p-value of 0 0.05 because it only happened 70% of the time. It didn't happen 95% of the time. So a lot of the problems that we have when we see that the uh, particular training program doesn't work is because maybe it did work but it only works 70% of the time. And if I had a team and I had a weight training program and it made 70% of my athletes much stronger, 
I'd still consider that a pretty good uh, program. But the reviewers who are reading my articles and everybody else's articles, and if I put P is equal to 0 0.09, and then I say, well, there is a trend towards this happening. You know, we had a trend towards people responding to this program. Almost every time I say there's a trend and it's P is equal to 0 0.09 or 0 0.08, the reviewers will say bullshit. That didn't meet the 0 0.05, therefore nothing happened. Not that there's a trend, maybe there's a suggestion. No, nothing happened because it was 0 0.06 or 0 0.07. Um, and so even if you're using magnitude-based inferences where you're using effect sizes and you've got a moderate effect size or large effect size, if it doesn't hit 0 0.05, you're not normally going to get it published. So that's one of the biases there and, and when we're looking at the research. But if we do look at um, some of the variables, and like I say, we normally try to be reductionist, but if we're not reductionist, what, uh, what are some of the problems? So some of the notes that I wrote down is, of course, when we're trying to uh, have somebody adapt, we have to give them a stress. That stress can be based on the volume of work they're going to do, the intensity of work. But when we're thinking of volume work, of course, many of the studies is going to say, okay, we've got a resistance training study. We're going to have them work out three times a week for uh, one hour each, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and do that for the next eight weeks. But often in those studies, they might not monitor the, um, the aerobic or the anaerobic training they're doing, or they might not uh, monitor the amount of uh, training that happens in the practice sessions, or they might not even monitor the activities of daily living. So you may be doing a lot of different things, walking around all the time and uh, adding a lot of calories being burned because you've got to walk, maybe you live um, three kilometers from the university, so you've got to walk back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of outside volume of activity that's going on that's, uh, that's often not, um, uh, not being monitored. Now we know that, of course, everybody has, as Claude Bouchard would say, has uh, you know, different genetics. We tend to uh, have our protein synthesis uh, uh, rates going at, at different rates. So some people can you know, build up muscle fast. Uh, I was a, a football player at the University of Ottawa back in the 70s. I know most of you haven't, weren't even born in uh, anywhere near that time, but I was playing football. And, and uh, um, I remember in high school, uh, there's two uh, I don't know if you remember a guy named Mike Murphy. He was a fullback for the Auto Rough Fighters back in the 80s. Anyways, Mike Murphy and I were approximately the same size. And we left high school. We both weighed 198 pounds. I worked my ass off for a few years, and I got up to 207 pounds. Mike Murphy got up to 228 pounds, all muscle. So his... His gene profile allowed him to hypertrophy to a much greater extent than, than I did. So we, we don't have that gene profile of everybody that we're working with. And therefore, of course, we don't know other than um, you know, monitoring um, peripherally how fast these people are going to have protein synthesis. And so some people may be able to work out every um, 36 hours or if they're on steroids every 24 hours. Uh, whereas somebody else may uh, not be able to work out or not get full protein synthesis or, or uh, overload adaptations unless they wait another 72 hours. So we can't do gene profiles in all these people. We don't have the money, but somehow we have to watch them to see who's responding faster. And then you may be familiar with um, satellite cells. Does everybody know what satellite cells are? So satellite cells are going to allow us to adapt faster as well. So for instance, I'm 63 years old. Uh, I've been working out for 40 something years. If I got injured and I had to take a whole year off and I came back, these satellite cells are gonna be sitting on my uh, muscle membrane and they will have added more protein to my muscle and will allow me to get back to my original uh, state much faster than somebody who was, let's see, a year from now, 64 years old, and never worked out before. So somebody with this muscle memory of satellite cells is gonna have faster protein synthesis. So again, your trained state is going, or previously trained state is gonna have a, a big effect on whether you're gonna respond quickly or not. Um, there's a, a concept known as the mental energy deficit. Now, 
I, I've uh, used this because I do uh, some research on an area that I call non-local muscle fatigue. Non-local muscle fatigue or crossover fatigue means if I worked out this bicep and got it really tired, then I tested this bicep, this bicep would have impairments, all right? Don't have to do anything to it. As long as this side was tired, this side will also get tired. One of the um, mechanisms is that for me to fatigue this bicep, I'd have to concentrate. So normally in our, our studies, we do like two 100 second MVCs. So there I am, 100 seconds, I give them 30 seconds rest, I go another 100 seconds. Now they're tired. Then I ask them to go to this arm, which hasn't exercised at all, and you think nothing should happen, but it gets tired because it can't focus. So in terms of long-term, that's just an acute uh, situation. In terms of long-term training though, if that individual is in, the, in their exams, so uh, they've been working hard in exams, they've had labs, something emotional has happened, then they could have a mental energy deficit and they won't be able to activate their muscles to the same extent. They won't have the same amount of uh, uh, muscle fatigue endurance because they can't send a strong signal because their focus, their attention, their cortical strength isn't uh, the same as it was if they were fresh. So again, what time of year is it? Is it before exams? Is it before midterms? That's going to affect uh, whether you're going to respond or not. Um, Lingering injuries. So a person um, uh, sprained their ankle, hurt their shoulder, their back, they're lifting, they seem fine. But my PhD research, uh, we looked at muscle activation patterns in people who had previously broken their ankles. Uh, it was a tough study to do because you had to wait when we were in Montreal and uh, you had to wait for it to uh, uh, have an ice, ice fall so people will slip off the uh, um, off the sidewalks and break their ankles and then I'd have some subjects I could test or have some athletes who would, uh, uh, who would injure themselves. But basically what we found was that they would get out of their casts, we would test them like a month later or more and to see what their ability was to uh, fully activate their muscles. And we found that every single one of them uh, had difficulties in activating their muscles even a month after they got out of the cast and they had been working out, et cetera. There's another study, I didn't do this one, but there's another study where they looked at people with shoulder injuries and they tested them a year later, not like six weeks or eight weeks like I did, but a year later, and they still had deficits in muscle activation. So you can have people out there, your athletes out there who seem to be fine, but if there's some, you know, if you had a shoulder problem and that shoulder's joint capsule isn't exactly as it was before, there's going to be inhibitory signals going back and, and uh, inhibiting your ability to, uh, to activate. So um, the, the background in terms of their uh, injuries is really, really important to know. And um, then in, we were talking about nutrition. So of course, obviously we have to know whether they've got enough protein, enough vitamins, etc. But a really important part is, especially with our uh, university athletes, is what kind of social life do they have? You know, are they out partying three days a week? You know, again, when I played football, I would go out on a Saturday night because we played Saturday afternoon, but I wouldn't be drinking Thursday and Friday. But of course, that's not everybody. And if you're drinking on Thursday and Friday night or Saturday or all three nights, that alcohol is going to inhibit your glycogen regeneration. And it's going to take you a lot longer to recover uh, because you've been uh, partying too much. I've got one more that I'll give you uh, so I, I don't go on forever. And this was a study, um, uh, it might be a factor that can be used to help uh, alleviate some of these problems. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Israel Halperin. Uh, Israel was a grad student of mine, now he's a, a prof at the University of Tel Aviv, but he's done a lot of work, did his PhD in Australia, and he's looked at a lot of psychological factors. And one of the studies that he did was that he had individuals, uh, his athletes, he gave them choices. So today, do you want to do, I don't know, two sets of 10 at 80% 1RM? Do you want to do four sets of 10 at 80% RM? How are you feeling today? And he allowed them to choose what they were going to do that day. And then, of course, he had the other group, the typical group, and said, you know, this is your program. You're doing four sets of 10, 80%, whatever, um, three days a week. And what he found was a group that had the independence to choose what kind of workout they had, 
had better results. So was that because they could um, had, had a better handle on what was happening inside their body and they knew that day that they were a bit weaker and they, they chose to do less and on good days they chose to do more? Or was it psychologically completely that, you know, I've got the ability to choose my pattern, my training pattern, and that gives me more mental independence, makes me want to work better, I don't know. He's not sure why, why it is, but he did find that when they had the choices, they made the choices that were better for them. And so, of course, they recovered faster, and they, well, I shouldn't say they recovered faster, they adapted better. So that was some of the notes that I made uh, this morning. That last one is really cool. I find that really intriguing. Yeah, yeah, to, to, to give them their own independence. You know, you still, of course, provide them with the parameters, but they have a choice within that parameter of what they want to do. And so that conflicts with some of the research in average Joe's where if you allow them to self-select load, they tend to under load, right? They go to low RPs. Um, in motivated athletes, that could be a factor. And I've, I've played with that with my athletes. I'm just, I haven't played with it enough to know that long-term it is a better strategy. I just know that I have athletes that come in and they're just, they're just worn out. So I say, mm -hmm. okay, you can just do a pump or we can do this a little bit lighter and a little bit faster. And, at least it gets them through that day. I don't know if anybody else here has had more experience than that to say, yes, we have found that those people who kind of had their own uh, selection ability were overall not falling behind. Because at least if they're not falling behind, it's a great strategy because mentally they're, they're taking ownership of it. Anybody else yeah. have experience with that? And Helper in Israel was uh, working at the, he did his PhD at the Australian Institute of Sport. So obviously he had very highly motivated individuals. Mm -hmm. So let's go back then. Uh, I was interested in the willpower, your willpower sink. We know that in um, a lot of different research related to uh, eating behaviors, we know that we have this willpower pool that gets degraded over time throughout the day. And that's why you snack uncontrollably at night versus in the mornings. Uh, people aren't hitting the chip bags too hard. Um, we know that we can influence that willpower sink by challenging the brain with uh, cognitive tasks. So repeated cognitive tasks tend to drain that sink and you tend to snack more. Um, so you're saying that when it comes to intensity of training and uh, self, again, you can come back to that self-selected or auto-regulated training, you can predict that people will not train with the same intensity or enthusiasm. There's this central fatigue element that's going on. Or do you think it's more of a general adaptive ability due to inflammation or who knows what other neurophysiological factors? Yeah, no, I would say it's, it's the, uh, the ability to focus and maintain uh, attention. So uh, in, our, in our case, we would, like I say, we would fatigue this, uh, this arm and then we would test them by doing 12 separate MVCs on this arm. And we uh, would, would invariably see that uh, performance would go down in the non-exercise arm. So you know, there's other um, uh, mechanisms suggested that, you know, neuro inhibition, but we've actually tested for that. And it's, uh, we've seen actually excitation of the uh, um, uh, corticospinal excitability rather than inhibition. So we don't think it's that. There's the uh, biochemical mechanism, which means that if I'm building up hydrogen ions and such and lactate over here, it circulates and will affect um, this arm. So that's a possibility biomechanical factors being if I have to do something with this arm, I have to uh, work my core to make sure I stabilize. So then if my core gets tired and I have to try and do something with this arm, since I'm not as stable, then it'll affect this output as well. But mental energy deficit seems to be, uh, seems to work in, uh, in all the uh, rationales that, that we did. And there's all sorts of studies that show, you know, like you said, I give somebody an exam, like I just do some math beforehand and their subsequent performance is uh, decreased. So my studies have been acute studies. They haven't been uh, longitudinal studies, but I would, I'm just extrapolating. I would imagine that if you're doing exams, then you're mentally deficient um, and uh, therefore it's going to definitely affect uh, your ability to uh, work out at a high intensity the next day. I imagine that, you know, if you said to yourself, I got an exercise phys exam tomorrow, I'm going to go for a slow run, then that's not going to be any uh, big problem because you don't have to focus too much.
But if I've got to do uh, high intensity training or something intense, you need focus. And um, with a mental energy deficit, you don't have that same capability. Good. And then one more thing, and then we're going to go on to Andrew is um, when I look at resistance training research and non-responsiveness to training, I'm not finding a lot. Am I missing something? Is it not there? People, uh, researchers just haven't gone there because of the, all the variables involved in re resistance training compared to everybody's obviously doing high intensity interval training type uh, work. Am I missing something? Is it out there? No, I think the, the researchers are missing something. Uh, I've done a, a few studies on a post-activation potentiation. And when we go into that area, there are so many studies that say that it doesn't happen. Now, of course, in terms of post-tetanic potentiation, if you do a twitch, you see the twitch go up. But in terms of what the term they're now using is PAPE, P-A-P-E, and uh, that's, you know, you do a condition activity and then you test them for some voluntary activity. You know, how high can they jump? What can they lift? How fast can they sprint? And um, you, you, you see so many studies that say, well, it doesn't work. But what we did in one study was that we tested people at one, three, five, and 10 minutes afterwards. And we uh, did a, a usual ANOVA where we did um, like two groups. We had the group that did the conditioning activity and group that didn't. And then it was a two by four ANOVA. So the four was the four times, one, three, five, and 10 minutes. We found nothing significant. So if you just looked at it that way, you'd say, oh, well, we can't potentiate. But then what we did is we looked at, did anybody potentiate at any time? And so we had, I don't know, 16 people, and we might have had three people potentiated at one minute, four people potentiated at three minutes, four people potentiated at five minutes, three people potentiated at 10 minutes. So they all potentiated, but they potentiated at different times. So when we changed the stats and said, okay, was there any potentiation? And we just made it a, like a one-way ANOVA. Yes, potentiated, no potentiated. Then we could say, yes, every, almost everybody, there's one person didn't. But statistically, there was a potentiation. So again, same thing when you're reporting. If you've got a you know, number of non-responders and responders, not a lot of people look at the frequency. They just look at that stupid p-value. And if the stupid p-value is in 0.05, then they either don't publish it or they say that nothing happened. Why can't humans be more like Wistar rats and stuff like that? We should start <laughs> breeding, breeding humans in colonies so we can do easier research, right? So speaking of rare breeds, country, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> speaking of rare breeds, let's go on to Dr. Andrew Cochran. <laughs> tell, us what, tell us about the CSIO. You guys monitor the heck out of everything. And you were monitoring one of your athletes forever. And it took you almost two years to come to one simple conclusion. So tell us in general what you guys uh, do and some of the experiences you've had with non-responding athletes. And then that little anecdote I've been alluding to. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I, I agree that we need to start breeding with star humans, but uh, uh, we haven't quite got there, maybe in Copenhagen or something. Um, anyway, the, uh, yeah, so basically, I think in terms of when it comes to this, yeah, we'll get into, everyone kind of monitors a little bit differently, depending on the sport, depending on the program, and so on and so forth, but um, it's one of those things where I, it's not just high performance, but any coach you go to and say, Hey, we didn't, we just trained for three months and didn't get a result. That's, that's not exactly a great, um, or a fun conversation. So like the end result is you have to Sherlock your way through it and figure out why this exactly happened. And I think the, I think I'm glad that you, you put up the Bouchard data because, uh, like, I think that is something that's missing in the, in the research field in the sense of like the, the negative findings aren't, aren't, published and very seldomly is the individual data published. Um, and so I think people are kind of, I think the fact that there are non-responders out there is, is a little bit um, overlooked and, and you're looking at, you're talking about uh, resistance training type non-responders. There is one paper in 2010 Erskine where they showed that there are people that go backwards in terms of their, their, uh, physiological cross-sectional area, et cetera, in terms of like a nine week training study of leg extension. And basically they showed some people had uh, an improvement of 25% or 20% in their, in their cross-sectional area. 
and then other people went backwards and they their mean one rm gain was 68 percent but the range was between 18 and 113 percent in nine weeks and so and that was in 53 untrained males but the like so there's the range is out there it's just we often don't see it or when we read the research we often see like okay this is what we should be getting based off of this particular intervention but yeah there's a, a ton of factors that we need to to take into account so yeah with us it's like if you if you run into an athlete who's who's training to be in the olympics and and you see you work with them for a while and they don't improve then obviously you got to try and find out why so i think the best way to do that is is when you're trying to solve any problem the more data you have the better um and so with us you obviously track i think it becomes kind of a process of elimination right so um for myself it's like if i have a negative result or a, or a suboptimal result or compared to what i'm looking for um first step is looking at their training attendance did they do the training well that's pretty straightforward if they didn't you have your answer secondly what kind of training did they do well they made the hit all the sessions but it, were they injured so how many other sessions did you have to modify so i've had people who have trained for two or three months and then you look back at their data and only so i mean that we lost you andrew you're locked up hello hello oh, always hey. fine you can always look back there oh Good. sorry guys sorry, i'm gonna you locked up for about 30 seconds there yeah shut up okay i'm just gonna i'm gonna drop my my video out because yeah, i am having a, a few uh internet issues yeah. But yeah, so, so you, it's basically uh, when we one. lost you. You said a, a attendance injury, and then did you start a new one? Yeah, well, it's just kind of from there. It's like you look back into the we do daily monitoring questionnaires, so we know that not we know physiologically people are going to have variable responses to their their training, but they also have psychological differences too. So for the same training load, some people are going to recover easily the next day and other people are going to be down for three days depending on habitual stress habitual recovery practices things like that so are things kind of trending upwards in terms of their well-being scores or, or and when i say trending upwards i mean negatively um so it's like are they are they becoming more stressed are they becoming more irritable are they having more sleep disorder or sleep uh, disruptions and things like that so you look at that too um and getting into the anecdote uh of my athlete it was it was exactly that process so basically um we had this athlete who compared to the other athletes was was gaining height on her jump and at, at a very slow rate so um and it seemed like her she would gain a centimeter here and there as she gained body weight so it was kind of like okay gain a kilo here gain a centimeter there and so on and so forth but comparatively to other athletes like it was much much slower than everyone else um and so kind of looked at all those things she was her her compliance was perfect no injury issues to speak of um you look at her at her well-being scores and they're basically like nothing nothing that really stood out but when you start seeing trends like that with the body weight thing um okay you kind of think all right well maybe she's she's well, she was never a very particularly explosive athlete so maybe she's a little bit more force dependent and requires a bit more muscle mass gain if she's going to improve uh what we saw was one time she left for her her off season break and when she came back she was two three kilos lighter and as a result the 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 body weight or the the jump scores had gone down pretty significantly too so that's one thing but she was just coming off of an off season so that's not unexpected to have a little bit of a drop in terms of performance but then each subsequent test that we did um it seemed like her body mass was was 
going steadily lower, steadily lower. And, and with it, her jump. And after about four months of this or six months of this, she reached her basically her lowest jump height she'd ever reached. And, and coincident with that was her lowest body mass. So she, in the course of six months, I think she went from 65 kilos down to 59. So obviously there's red flags going off there, right? So when we initially, or when I initially thought that maybe there was a, a, a muscle mass component to this, that was when we, um, we added DEXA scanning. So, uh, or body composition uh, monitoring. And basically the nice part about the DEXA scan is it doesn't just give us a measure of, of muscle mass and fat mass, but it also, even though we don't use the diagnostic method, we, we still get a, a rough a measurement of the, of the bone density. And so when you have an athlete who's training six days a week in a high impact jumping sport and doing strength training three days a week, and you see the bone density numbers trend downwards, um, it's pretty obvious that something's not right there as far from, a, from an energy availability standpoint. So that was kind of, we, we kind of established that obviously the, there is a nutritional component to this. And like, obviously you can't, you can't build muscle mass if you don't have the building blocks for the muscle mass, right? So you can't just lift weights and expect to gain mass if you're, if you're um, hypochloric, right? So essentially this, this ended up being a, uh, yeah, as you said, kind of a two-year process where you're working working with the dietitian, working with the athlete, um, trying to slowly, slowly correct this, this trajectory, so to speak. And we did see some, uh, rebound effect, like she definitely started trending, trending upwards again, as we could put some more mass on. But at that point, it also really became, um, when you get into disordered eating and things like that, it's as much of a psychological issue as it is a, a nutritional issue. So it's been a it's been a long long term process to try and walk this athlete back towards um, towards um, improving her her physical performance because uh, at some point it's kind of like obviously the, the SNC is not the problem and I think you kind of you start going into that Sherlocking or that problem solving process to kind of find out whether you're programming is horrible or if it's some other factor and and but eventually when you when you stumble across an issue like that then s and c becomes the least of your concerns and you start to to look at athlete well-being and some other some other things like that and find other avenues to try and um other avenues that might be completely separate from s and c that actually um will eventually help the response Yeah, so you had to dig around quite a while. Like you, you guys inquired about her nutrition for years, and it looked like she had everything completely under control, right? It, it it was just a matter of time before you got into her head and were able to identify the eating disorder. Like you tried fifty yeah. different things, didn't you first? Well, uh, yeah, I guess the the issue is is when you're also when you're working with with athletes and you're working with human beings, as you said, um, you can kind of only go based off of the information that they give you, right? So, and an issue, one issue with, with disordered eating is denial, right? So we had basically um, over the course of that first year that we were dealing with this, essentially um, it was a, there was the, the narrative that she was giving us in the sense of doing all the right things, but then there was the objective narrative that was coming from the data and coming from the jump data, the, the body mass data, the DEXA data, um, all showing that the, the trend was continuing negative despite the fact that she was saying she was, she was doing all the right things. So yeah, it was a, it was a process because um, initially, uh, initially you think that this is maybe just a nutritional gap and it's something that needs to be corrected from a, from a knowledge and an education standpoint. But the longer it goes on and the longer we see that that's clearly not 
the the root cause, then you have to explore other avenues as to to what is actually causing this. So yeah, it takes a long time because depending on the relationship with the athlete, with the different practitioners on the on the support team, um, they might not the athlete might not feel comfortable disclosing an issue, or if there's if there's a shame element there, or if there's something like that that uh, or um, or obviously with, with eating disorders and, and things like that, there's a high level of perfectionism. So they're not really necessarily willing to um, admit it because they kind of see it as a, as a flaw or a problem. So yeah, there's a, there's a process there in terms of trying to earn that trust and earn that buy-in and, and, and at times kind of, We've even at some, at one point we even had to implement a, like a contract under the under the direction of the of the doctor saying that if she did not uh, stop losing weight um, that she'd be pulled from training. So there's yeah it's a it's a process in trying to determine what's true versus what is what you're being told and and what's actual what's fact and what's not. And then there's, there's an element where it, it, sometimes you have to um, play hardball, so to speak, and for their, for their own sake, in at least the, this context, right? So, um, yeah, it's definitely not easy, but it starts off pretty simple thinking like, okay, what's wrong with my program? And then, again, having the more data you have, the better, because you can actually kind of uh, work your way backwards and try and solve some of these prob- problems. So I have a couple other questions for you, but uh, I'm going to go on to Sam because I think the questions to you could involve everybody. So what we've seen now, we've talked a little bit about the research and all the confounds that could go into determining what is a responder versus non-responder. Now we've seen some specific examples of how you've tried to break down why an athlete isn't responsive. to this. So let's go into Sam's little experiment and what she was observing with her football squad and what she tried to determine. Yeah, so off season last year, uh, I'll try and make this part a little bit quick based on time. Um, we went into an off season football training five to six days a week, um, mainly morning sessions, which will be relevant later uh, due to, you know, trying to get everyone in because we have to fit all of our teams in at a 1500 square foot space. Notice after a few months of training and mainly strength and mass goal within that uh, periodization period, there was a large group of our athletes struggling to bring up their mass. At let alone keep it there, uh, a lot of loss, uh, and their numbers were not improving much in the gym, which uh, if we assume that the programs we write are okay, uh, majority of our te- team's training age is pretty low, uh, which typically happens when you get into the university setting at the beginning. So anything really should have made some sort of improvement. Um, through some general discussion with a lot of athletes, it became clear that quite a few of them did not eat breakfast in the morning. And then with further discussion, you know, able to identify fueling more than 2,000 calories a day, which was especially shocking uh, in that male demographic. Um, The first route was obviously trying to implement some nutrition education to work on some of those poor dietary habits, but um, there ended up being a bit of a deeper source of concern. And for those of you that that know the area in which I work um, at York University, it is uh, within that Jane and Finch area and about half of our roster, just over half of our roster, um, comes from that local area. And we have a significantly higher amount of athletes in low socioeconomic statuses than any other university in the OUA. So education can only go so far if the athletes just don't have the means to get it. So obviously, we're at this point pretty anecdotal and just kind of talking and spit, spit firing with a lot of our administration because it was a, a big issue across the board for most of our programs, actually. So we had a, had a placement student from Sheridan, Chris Adams, uh, and we had him do a survey uh, looking at performance barriers from everything from, um, and I'll just share my screen a little bit here, but everything from uh, like general history, expenses, income, dietary habits, performance, um, and some of the things that came out of it, and you know, I don't have any p-values here, but just the idea of gathering information like uh, Andrew was saying, and trying to figure out really what's going on with our athletes in a, in a large sense, uh, and then trying to compare them to some of our numbers. Well, the first notable barrier uh, identified was breakfast consumption. So 51% uh, 
of the team had caloric intake before uh, training five days or more a week. 29% of the team ate breakfast two days or less a week. And again, our, our list for that program in particular from 6.30 to 12 p.m. So we had a lot of athletes that uh, weren't even really um, eating before 12. Um, and obviously we know that research shows that those that don't have carb consumption for exercise fatigue earlier, right? So um, one of the second things that we really noticed was uh, trend was revolved around student employment rates. So on the, on the left, we have a number of reported hours each athlete worked a paid job in the past seven days, and this is based on kind of their average work week. And then 39 of the 53 guys who answered uh, this question responded working less than five hours in the past week. This is a bit understandable because athletes are busy with school and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But what the results in this graph on the right, looking at the amount of income each athlete has made from a paid job in the past seven days, uh, is, is pretty significantly low as well. So 35 of the 53 guys responded to make less than $100 a month, which translates to less than $20 a week. Um, now, this itself does not mean that this is the reason they aren't reaching their potential, but with further analysis, you know, we were able to uh, see some additional trends where out of those who earned less than $100 in the past month from employment, 61% um, earned $0 in scholarship and bursary, 58% earned zero in OSAP grants, and 38.9% earned zero total from scholarship bursaries and grants. Um, so, I mean, only 40% of the guys who didn't receive the money ate breakfast five or more days a week with 30% of these guys eating breakfast less than two days a week. So, I mean, a couple things we were really trying to identify were, um, you know, is there this connection between low economic status and poor uh, dietary habits? Or, you know, are we really just identifying that uh, they're probably one and the same for certain demographics? So, we looked at their performance changes in the gym, strength numbers in particular, those who received bursary and scholarship and ate breakfast more than five times a week made the most gains. Those who ate less than three times a week and didn't any scholarship or bursaries made the least amount of improvement. So obviously research would suggest, you know, reviews of athletes in the state show for collegiate athletes show that a significant factor to athletes of all sports not reaching caloric demands is financial strain, but it appears there's a similar trend here at York, but like I said, I think we're in a bit of a bigger uh, issue being in the York region than a lot of other football programs across the OUA. Uh, one of the positive things that came out of this study was that, uh, or this survey, I would say, is that within our athletic department, they identified that this was an issue, and they have now put in a fueling station for smoothies and breakfast options for quick snacks. Um, COVID obviously put a little bit of a wrench in that plan, because we can pretty much do nothing, but that was a bit of a benefit within our department. But uh, I, the idea of are they coming to training? Yes, they were. Uh, I had very, very good attendance in like the 98%. Do we think the volume was was good enough? Or do we think the training was good enough? I do, uh, and it, and they worked hard. But we had to adapt their train or their training program based on the fact that the volume that they were actually doing was too much for them, based on the fact that they weren't able to. Uh, consume enough uh, calories within the day. So that was one of the areas that we, we've tried to focus on here in terms of fueling initiatives for our student athletes. Yeah, so it seems pretty obvious, those kinds of uh, factors. Uh, unfortunately, you got cut short and weren't able to get all the data, but it seemed fairly intuitive that would be a good lead. But I want to pose a question to everybody now, and this is going back to Andrew's talk too, is can we assume that Unlike Claude Bouchard's data, where it showed that certain people just aren't responders, can we assume that all athletes should be responders? Is that a safe assumption that given all the perfect scenarios, our athletes, because they're athletes, you know, they've got certain potential that not every average Joe has. Can we assume they're all responders? Anyone, even you, Brock Folk. I, I don't necessarily think so. Um, I think I think you can't necessarily say that if you're a responder in one area that you're going to necessarily respond in another way area. And even in some of those follow-up studies from from Claude Bouchard, they they showed that um, that people like basically your baseline VO2 max didn't really have a great 
effect on how responsive you were. So you could be a, you could be a, a, have a high baseline and you can have a low, have a low response or vice versa, right? You can have a, a low baseline and a very high response. So I think you can, I think that everyone is, has, depending again on their, their genetic background, assuming that all other factors are equal. Um, I think you're going to have a, a great, um, you're going to have that variable response. And unfortunately, when you don't have 500 people in your study or in your training group, that when one person out of five or six people does not respond, then it's pretty, it's a lot more glaring. Anyone else? Any conflicting? I would say that that's probably true. I would say on average athletes tend to be more responsive, but like you said, high potential, low responsives will overcome low potential, high responsiveness a lot of days, right? And I've had some decent athletes I've worked with that weren't very responsive. Dave, you're going to say something. Um, I think I think at times we can assume that our program is maybe um, appropriate when it's probably not appropriate for everyone in the group. So I think I think it's important to figure out like some people are going to respond to higher volumes, lower volumes, higher intensities, lower intensities, and kind of keeping note of what you're doing and when people are responding um, you just need to find ways to build in variation in your program so that you can hopefully hit everyone along the spectrum yeah how do you go about doing that so we all, well, one of andrews um when i saw his slides when he gave his original presentation he showed that most of the athletes were improving 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 but there's this one that wasn't what percentage of your athletes should you see improving before you start thinking okay maybe my program is not right or when do you identify an, agile, uh, an athlete who you could call quote unquote a hard gainer or more volume responsive or more intensity responsive or whatever you may be? Like I know when I was powerlifting, I responded my periodization protocol, two weeks of training, one week unload, three days a week, two, day, two weeks, and then I'd unload. Like that's incredibly low volume when you really add it up over time. But, but it took some journaling and stuff over time to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. It was Maybe kind of so. by luck actually it worked out, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, if you're, if we're tracking things on our athletes, I know that like the, obviously the CSO, they're monitoring a lot of things. We're trying to monitor some things. There's going to be periods of time when just through normal training prescription, you're going to go through higher volume, um, lower intensity, lower volume, higher intensity, take note of which athletes are responding in those periods. Um, based on regular monitoring that you may be doing, be it jumps, be it sprints, be it strength, whatever you're kind of looking at, and then start to bucket those athletes out into those types of groups over time, right? It is, it's a long-term process, but you got to kind of be aware of who you're working with and what kind of response. And then you can have the conversations with them. Like, how are you, or how do you feel on this type of training? Um, as long as you have a decent relationship, they'll probably give you a good answer. Um, some of the strategies that I've used in the past are, with large teams, if we have say six sets of work to get through, um, I might just set a cap on it on 20 minutes. And those athletes who like to grind and go through things a little faster are probably going to get through all six sets. The ones that maybe need a little bit more time to recover. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get mad at them if it takes them, um, if they only get through three or four sets in that 20 minutes or whatever we're kind of working through and it kind of allow them to self select a little bit based on the time frame um, that we're kind of giving them. So there's a few ways you can build in, sort of checks and balances, hopefully to fix, to get a little closer to being individual towards people, I think. I made the mistake of doing that once in one cycle and telling them, uh, let's see who can get the most sets done in 20 minutes. <laughs> that's, yeah, and that's then it, <laughs> they were blown up for three weeks. <laughs> Some of them did 15 sets at 80% for three. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was awful. So if we had to wrap this up, let me share one more thing. I put together this little thing while you guys were chit-chatting. Could we classify into a document like this um, how we could determine or how we would go about evaluating whether the non-responder is due to the actual S&C program, whether it's due to their um, actual sport. I find that most of the time non-responses because they're just doing so much of their sport. And then how much is within lifestyle? Could we um, brainstorm some factors to consider under each of these to determine, uh, you know, how you could troubleshoot whether a non-responder is taking place? This is open mic. Go for it. 
Well, I think I think like I said before, I think the always always under the SNC program, the first the first two questions are did they do the program and did they do it at full capacity or as programmed? There's always there's always either injuries or, or potentially issues there or or if they're not super driven, are they coming in and just going through the motions, not not actually pushing themselves, not uh, hitting the hitting the percentages that they're supposed to be at, and that kind of thing. So those are the first two questions I basically always look at. I would add: Is the majority of your team improving? My uh, my little comment is: uh, I don't like that uh, term non-responder because I think if we give a person uh, the 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 appropriate program for their genetics, their um, their nutrition, etc. They're going to respond somehow. You know, going back to that story I said about my inability to gain a lot of weight. You know, in three or four years, I gained like eight pounds of muscle, whereas my buddy gained thirty. So I was a low responder, but I wasn't a non-responder. Um, so I would probably. I'm sure there are people that that maybe no non-responders, but there's got to be something out some. Um, mechanism or factor that's causing them to be non-responder because physiologically we have to respond to stress in some way but of course if the stress is not properly applied then we can't turn non-responder so I think most of the time we're more worried about the low responder versus the high responder um, under sport <coughs> uh, I would uh, put in is the uh, uh, is the is the the training and the competition similar so if uh, we're in a, uh, you want to be in a, in a power uh, program and your uh, sport is uh, basketball or volleyball and you're jumping all the time, uh, obviously you have to take into consideration that you're, you're probably overtraining at the moment. And then I had mentioned in my list their lifestyle, you know, social, social life, partying. The, uh, that's such a big thing as a university student is your, uh, your social life and how that can interfere with, uh, with your training. So I'm, I'm obviously I, I have a, a lot of experience with alcohol consumption, but you know, I'm not that experienced with drug consumption, but uh, you know, I'm not sure what uh, a few nights of uh, heavy uh, grass smoking uh, would do to you. But uh, obviously I know the alcohol consumption is a, a negative uh, factor. I'm just going to chime in quickly there and say, since uh, cannabis has been legal in Ontario, we've definitely had a significant issue here with uh, consumption in and around training sessions. Wow. It's been a bit of a problem. And has it been a big um, impact on their ability to train? Yeah, I mean, it typically ends up being a couple of the outliers that aren't really doing well in terms of compliance or um, uh, I would say responding, if that's kind of the word that we're going with. But uh, there are university has had to be pretty strict in terms of the usage in and around over a period of time uh, within training. So, yeah, that's a tough one, right? Like even alcohol. Well, I don't know which is worse: binge drinking all weekend or smoking a few dubs before a workout. I'm not even sure. Um, good study there for you, Dave. Mm -hmm. That's right. Some grad, some grad student will take that on. I'll be a subject. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I always teach my young kids, so I have a lot of 16, 17 year olds who are just at that point, right? And I said, every time you're drinking your face off, the inflammation you're causing is like giving yourself the flu. Do you want to have the flu? And how's that going to affect your training? Some of them get it, they buy into it. Anything else? What else can we put in these groups? Anything else we should consider? So, this is just kind of synopsis. Whenever you're dealing with someone who's non responder, what are all the things you should consider and could you narrow it down into these categories? Anything else, Dave? Ian, you've been so quiet today. Nothing to add. No, I'm just learning, man. Just learning and listening. Good okay. stuff. Absorbing like a sponge. Right. I think under sport, you could probably, you could, 
you could look at it like obviously the the whole interference effect like if they're they're in a high volume high endurance um, focused sport um, it might be the fatigue it might be the fact that they're just burning so many calories that they don't have anything extra to put into muscle mass accretion um, and then kind of as as dr bema uh, alluded to like if they're jumping a lot if there's a really high eccentric component to to what they're doing on a on a day-to-day basis um, that could also uh, create so much damage that they can't even climb their way out of the hole before they uh before they do their next training session so those are a couple other things you can can consider and under your lifestyle with the life stress you may be put in brackets, both physical and mental, and both physical, mental, and emotional. Yeah. Getting back to that mental energy deficit. Yeah. Good. Because if you're uh, emotionally upset, you know, as we know, um, it's a it's a fight or flight mechanism. You know, even if you get dropped by your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you get a fight or flight mechanism. You get uh, cortisol release. Cortisol is going to affect your protein synthesis. So, you know, even being dumped by your partner is going to have an effect on your training. Hell yeah. More so than other things. Mm. Stress is stress, right? Good old Hans Selye. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go, folks. So we pushed our time limit a little bit. Any last words, Sam? Oh, thanks for coming in and sharing and sharing information. We're going to try and see where this takes us in some of our next job talks, but if anyone ever has any cool topics to talk about and, you know, start working on maybe uh, Dr. Bem, you can start to work and figure out how we can get those P values dropped and get some of that value information out. It's not making it past that strict. You, you think standard. you can solve that problem? You think that your voice will be the answer to that? I don't think I have that much pull in the, uh, oh, in the uh, science world. Oh, keep working on it. Keep up the mm. good fight. Yeah, so again, thanks to everybody. I thought that was a nice, fluid talk. Lots of information went out there. We didn't solve the world's problems, that's for sure. But hopefully, for those of you who haven't maybe thought about this, it's so often we have an athlete that's not responding and just saying, uh, they're just crap. <laughs> you know, they're just a bad athlete. Uh, there's nothing I can do. So now maybe you can start breaking down some of those things we just put together in those three different groups and trying to determine what are the factors? Could you tease out some of those factors and then maybe modify things ever so slightly to get some, something more out of your athletes? Anyway, so that's our time for today. Uh, thanks again for everybody coming out. Love your, um, your insights. Remember to pass on the link to friends who, or students who may want to um, listen in on some of these topics. And as Sam said, give us some ideas. Always look for ideas. And if we got to go a different time of day, we'll go a different time of day. I think it's nice to stay connected in any way we can across Canada. And that's one of the mandates of uh, my life as a strength coach, as well as obviously the Canadian Strength Conditioning Association.